the thing that people tend to sort of underappreciate was essentially, what is the job of the chart? What am I trying to accomplish with this chart? Am I trying to explain something to somebody? Am I trying to persuade them to do something? If you don't know why you're creating the chart, you actually can't really choose a chart type. Welcome to the Data Career Podcast, the podcast that helps aspiring data professionals land their next data job. Here's your host, Avery Smith. Welcome back to another banger episode of the Data Career Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Avery Smith. And episode 95, you guys, wow, that's absolutely incredible. We're almost to the triple digits, which will be quite fun. I'm very excited for today's podcast. And after listening, you're going to leave with a better idea of how to construct good data visualization, which is key for every data career that there is. We'll talk about what you should do before you even start making a chart. We'll talk about how to choose the right chart. And we'll talk about one of the coolest methods ever for creating data visualization, which is actually the way that I create charts. And I never realized it had a name, but it's super fun. It's super easy. It's a great method. And I think you guys will really enjoy it. My guest today is a data viz expert. His name is Nick Debra. And as an independent instructor and author, Nick has taught data visualization and dashboard design to literally thousands of professionals in over a dozen countries at organizations like NASA and Visa, Bloomberg, Shopify, United Nations, like he's done it everywhere, you guys. He delivers main stage talks at conferences and is a guest lecturer at Yale University. And his new book, Practical Charts, which we talk about in the episode, is available on Amazon and it's a top seller. So definitely check it out. We'll have Nick's links in the show notes or the description down below. So be sure to check those out. And let's go ahead and hop into this week's episode. Thank you guys for listening. Nick, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for joining us here. Yeah, I'm absolutely delighted to be here. I've been uh, enjoying it uh, for the last couple of weeks. It's uh, good stuff. I'm glad. And I've also been enjoying uh, your new book, Practical Charts. Um, I guess it's it's about six months old. You have an, even a new book out now. So Nick was gracious enough to, to send me a copy. We'll be talking about it today and definitely we'll have a link in the show notes down below. Great book to check out. And we'll be talking about a lot of the snippets from the book so you can get a good taste of, of what it's like. Congrats on the book. That's got to be a lot of work. Thanks. Yeah, it was. <laughs> even more I was, than I was expecting. And I was expecting a lot. I was going to say, you probably don't want to do that again, but you just did it again and just published again after six months. Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, sorry, the, 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 this one, the first one actually came out in November. So it's only been a few months, but then this one just came out last oh, right. week, uh, which is basically kind of an optional companion book that contains kind of more advanced chart types that, you know, things like scatter plots and histograms, which probably a lot of people watching this are going to be familiar with, but lots of audiences are not. And so I kind of split those quote unquote advanced chart types into a separate optional book for people who do have those more sophisticated audiences. Yeah, that's awesome. Look at me thinking that November was six months ago, but that was like 90 <laughs> it's COVID days ago. Time. <laughs> so yeah, I guess, I guess it still is. One of the things that is really cool about your book is there's, I think what, let's see here, five, seven different parts, but a good chunk of the book really from page, let's see, from page 79 to 212. So like 150 pages basically are choosing chart types. And so that's one of the things I, I wanted to, to talk to you about picking a right chart. And, and so if someone's maybe they're an accountant or maybe they're aspiring data analyst listening right now, how do you know what type of chart to make? Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it's funny because there's really, you know, depending on who you ask, you'll get two very different kinds of answers, right? If you ask an expert, somebody with years of data visualization experience, they'll probably say something like, well, you know, it's basically impossible to sort of codify that kind of decision. It's very complex and nuanced. And, you know, it just over time with experience, eventually kind of get a feel for it. And then if you talk to somebody who has maybe uh, less data visualization experience, more of a novice, they'll typically say, oh, it's very simple, right? If you have data over time, you use a line chart. If you have the breakdown of a total, you use a pie chart. I think there's a third option. And that's really why I wrote the book, which is based on a course that I've been teaching for a number of years now as well, which is essentially that, you know, there's sort of almost a middle ground where it's possible to actually, I think anyways, actually codify those decisions into 
you know, you'll see in the book, of course, there are decision trees. You can actually sort of follow steps, even if you don't have a lot of experience and we'll guide you to an expert level chart type choice. And so it's not as simple as something like, you know, oh, for data over time, always use a line chart. It's like, well, there, you know, I have a decision tree, for example, for showing data over time. And, you know, there are actually six possibilities there, six different types of charts. And there's about seven or eight factors that you need to take into account. And so it's not as simple as a novice thinks, but it's also not necessarily as sort of, you know, intuition based as a lot of experts seem to think like a lot of experts say, like, essentially, you, it's something you can't really codify right into formal rules and decision trees. But I, I would actually kind of disagree. I think you can codify it. Now, the process of actually codifying it, though, I'll be honest, was very difficult. It's Basically, some of the hardest work I've ever done is to come up with those decision trees. There's about 50 chart types between, you know, the two books. And, you know, those are sort of, you know, organized into, into seven or eight decision trees. And so it's kind of unsurprising that maybe it took a long time for those types of decision trees or, or kind of rule mate, uh, rules to kind of emerge, right? They, they are hard to distill, essentially. And so I think, yeah, like I said, that, that's almost the main reason why I wrote uh, the books is that I thought there were opportunities to essentially make it much easier to learn how to choose chart types like an expert. It doesn't require years of experience. In fact, it takes about as long as it would take you to read the book or to take my course. My course is two days if I teach it in person, four half days if it's online, which is a lot shorter than, you know, years of experience, essentially. You just gave us the short answer. The long answer is the 150 pages that are in the book that include those diagrams and those flow chart that you yeah. kind of made. Because it is hard to decide what the best chart is in the situation. It does take either following kind of a guide or years of experience to have the technique to be like, oh yeah, this data, this is what I'm trying to show. Poof, this is the chart I'm creating. Yeah, yeah. And there's lots of misconceptions around it too. Like a lot of people tend to think that, you know, choosing a chart type is, is all about the, the nature of the data, right? If it's the breakdown of total or uh, values with, with locations or, you know, and that sort of drives your chart type choice. And that's a factor, of course, you know, what kind of data are we showing? But the thing that people tend to sort of underappreciate also is essentially what is the job of the chart? You know, what am I trying to accomplish with this chart? Am I trying to explain something to somebody? Am I trying to persuade them to do something? Am I just trying to make them aware of some interesting trend or problem or something like that? And so, you know, if you don't know why you're creating the chart, you actually can't really choose a chart type. You know, you have to know both. You have to know what kind of data am I trying to show, but also what am I trying to say about the data? because that often is a, is a huge consideration in actually choosing a chart type. A lot of people don't necessarily really understand that until hopefully anyways, until they read the book. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. I think that's actually really interesting because a lot of the times it feels like we're creating a chart because maybe we've been asked to create a chart or we feel like creating a chart is, is the right scenario. But I, I kind of liked what you said that each chart has a job. Can you speak to that a little bit more? Yeah. In fact, you know, sometimes people ask me, like, is there kind of a central idea behind your book and your course? And I think that's basically it, right? Charts are basically graphics for doing a job. And that's not the way that most people think about charts. Most people think about charts as, you know, visual representations of data. But I don't think that's actually a really useful way to think about, you know, charts because, you know, all charts are visual representations of data, even really bad charts, you know, but only good charts do their job. And when you think about it that way as essentially, you know, a graphic for doing a job, it just completely changes the way that you even approach creating a chart in the first place. You know? Like when people start my course or before they read the book, they often think that, you know, when they sit down to create a chart, the first question they ask themselves is, what is the best way to visualize this data, right? But hopefully after reading the book, after taking the course, they're actually asking a different question, which is, do I know why I'm creating this chart in the first place? And that just requires a big mental shift. And it takes about two days <laughs> to sort of really think in that way, right? You know, so, so don't start with the data, start with the reason. Because unless you know why you're creating a chart, you know, is there a particular insight you're trying to communicate? Is there a particular question you're trying to answer? Then it's virtually impossible to make most chart design choices. 
you know, not just choosing a chart type, but also deciding how wide or narrow to make the scales, deciding what annotations to put in there, any comparison values, what colors to use. These are all driven by the why, or, you know, what or the purpose, the job of, of the chart. And so I tend to view charts almost almost kind of like products. You know, you're creating a, a communication product, right? It's not it's not like a something scientific or like a like a photograph or something like that of, of the data. It's basically your way to say something about the data and then to accomplish some kind of purpose, like to persuade people to do something or to explain something to them, et cetera. And so it is quite a different way of thinking, but it's a much more useful way of thinking that dramatically improves the odds that your chart is actually going to do whatever it is you wanted it to do, right? They don't create charts for no reason. There's always a reason, you know, like I said, persuasion or explanation or whatever. And it, your chart is much more likely to actually accomplish that if you approach it in, in that way. This is a graphic for doing a job. Yeah, mission-driven uh, data visualization is what I will mm. what I'll call that. You always want to be trying to show something, which is one of the things I wanted to talk to you about. One of the things that that I, I like to do is is create charts, and you know I'll walk my students through creating charts. And you create the chart, and there's always one kind of pesky thing that most of us do at the end, and and that is to name the chart or to give it a, a title, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of the times if we're <laughs> showing, for example, school data or something, we'll, we'll call it like school chart. Maybe we'll, we'll give it the name of the data set, like Massachusetts school data or something right. like that. But I, I think that's a little bit faulty. How do you suggest people to title their data visualizations? Yeah, so that, that's a great point. Like, uh, and again, this is something that, that people you know, have a, a lot of misunderstanding around, like a lot of people think of, of charts or good charts anyways, as being sort of just, just the numbers, right? With, and so you put just generic chart titles, just as much like the ones you were describing. I kind of disagree though. I think that charts are much more useful if we actually have key messages right in the chart itself. In fact, even, even the title of the chart could be something like, you know, whatever we have, we started to have a huge problem with, you know, student test scores in in July because whatever reason you might have in mind and even putting annotations in the chart little you know I favor kind of sort of handwritten typeface notes that say this is this is the thing right this is why I've decided to show this information to you now when I teach this in workshops a lot of times people kind of balk and they're like oh no 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 that's wrong that is that is not ethical right you know the chart should just show the data without any interpretation or messages explicitly stated because that's going to bias the audience, right? In terms of how to interpret the data and, and, and charts should be sort of neutral or interpretation free. And this sounds great, right? It sounds totally noble, but I don't think it's actually even theoretically possible to create an interpretation free chart, right? Like when you're making all of those decisions in terms of choosing a chart type and colors and scales and all that, you know, you basically have to have an insight in mind in order to make those decisions. If you don't know why you're creating the chart, you know, what message you're trying to communicate or what question you're trying to answer, then those design choices are going to be random and your chart will basically feature random insights, right? And so, but people like to think that they're creating neutral or sort of interpretation free charts. Like I said, I don't think that's even theoretically possible. Every chart you've ever created has your interpretation baked in, whether you realize it or not. It was driving most of your design choices. And so you might as well take that last step and just tell the audience, this is why I think you needed to see this information. Now, they might disagree, right? They might say, oh, well, you know, I think student test scores are actually declining for a totally different reason. And that's fine. That's great. Then you sit down, you talk about it because you know clearly pe different people have different understandings of, of reality or of what's actually happening but the solution can't be to try and create you know neutral or interpretation free charts because those don't exist we'll talk about this in, in a bit but really with data visualization the majority of the time you're trying to communicate right you're trying to show someone something that was previously hidden in data hopefully well but in what form of communication would you ever want to be unclear or ambiguous, right? In all, <laughs> in all communication, the more direct 
the easier it is to understand often the more effective it is not not to get political and this is not political but i mm. think that's one of the reasons why and you know there's been studies on this that that trump has spoken at like the lowest grade level ever as any sort of presidential candidate and yeah. you know politics aside i think that it's he's easy to understand what he's trying to say whether you like it or not the more simple that you can make your communication often the more better and so why would you want in the data visualization world to make your message muddied and and difficult to interpret it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense when you frame it the way you have framed it i feel like hopefully not right i mean but but charts are just like any other, for, other form of communication you know if you want to be dishonest you can be you know? yeah. like if you want to try and hide problems for example that the audience would probably want to know about it you can do that just as you can do that in a speech or in an email you know Apple. like yeah. exactly like uh, charts are no different in 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 that sense and so yeah, like, you know, hopefully you're not going to be doing that very often, but in terms of kind of the ethics of it, to me, lying with a chart is no different than lying with an email or with, you know, verbal communication. I know sometimes people tend to think that charts are somehow special or different and that, you know, all charts have to be truthful as being sort of somehow sort of different. Charts are no different than lying in, in any other way, essentially, even though, like I said, sometimes people think that charts are somehow special, a special form of communication where you always have to be honest, but ethically, you know, that's kind of up to you, whether you want to be lying or not, whether you do it with a chart or an email or whatever, it doesn't really make much difference as far as I'm concerned. Totally. I, I love How Charts Lie by Alberto Cairo, a mm -hmm. really good data visualization book. And yeah. it's actually interesting because... I think a lot of the times with email or with with a PowerPoint or even with the data visualization, you can even give the truth, portray the truth, but maybe in an untruthful way. One of my favorite examples to go back to Trump was one of the early visualizations in this book is a map that Trump actually showed where the whole United States was basically red. And it was yeah. what it was showing is who the counties voted for, right? Who won the county vote? And it turns out there's a lot of counties that voted for Trump and didn't vote Democrat. I think he's right. He's not telling a lie there. But he was saying that, you know, he should have won the election because look at this graph. And reality is, well, turns out individuals vote and not even individuals. You know, we have this whole system set up where it's like we have representatives and stuff like that. And it turns out that like, even though, you know, I don't know what county New York's in, but like mm -hmm. New York City, for example, even though it's one county, it's 10 million people versus if you go to, you know, like some some podunk county in Utah, like that might be 10,000 people. So it's like those counties are not equally weighted. And so it's just really crazy. Yeah. All the things, I mean, that wasn't an untruthful chart, but it just doesn't necessarily correlate to, yeah, I should have won the election because it turns out counties don't vote people do at the end of the day. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And of course the counties that tended to vote Republican were geographically just much exactly. larger. Right. Yeah. And so, yeah. And, and in fact, you know, I talk about this in, in my book as well, where it's actually really easy to, I mean, in that case, you could argue, but whether the kind of the, the deception was intentional or, or not, <laughs> That's true. Was, but, but, you know, I think what people are, are less often aware of is the fact that how, how easy it is to do that accidentally. Right. Sure. Where you're not yeah. actually trying to deceive anyone. And yet you end up creating a chart that does actually give an erroneous representation of the data. Right. And so, you know, one of the, I think, you know, the key skills that I try and teach in the book and the course is how to avoid doing that. And it's actually not, not particularly straightforward, even just by, you know, choosing a non-optimal chart type, you can actually distort people's perception of the data, sure. for example, or choosing, you know, some weird colors, even if you're not trying to deceive anyone. And so it actually requires a fairly high degree of skill to create charts that are reliably basically accurate, essentially a lot more than I think most people realize anyways, a lot more skill that's required. I agree with that. I want to go back to something you said earlier, and that is a lot of people when they're trying to make a chart, they think about, well, what chart should I make versus what's the mission or what's the job that this chart is going to serve? I almost think that there's there's a step before that most people, most novices in data visualization make. And that is first off, what charts do I know? Because I think I actually think people probably make wrong choices on charts based off of not realizing that there's more than just a bar and a pie chart, for example. Uh, yeah. I think most people probably start there. So that's the first thing is, well, what does ignorance play in this? Just not knowing that, wow, I could build 
you know, I could build really interesting charts if I just knew that, uh, that they existed. That's the first thing. And the second thing I think that people, and this correlates with it, is they think about what tool I'm going to create it in. Because, mm. you know, no one's really creating charts by hand. Although I think there is something to be said about a good handmade chart. But I think most people aren't going to take the time to do so. And so I think they, a lot of them probably are working in Excel. And if they're not in Excel, they're probably in Power BI or Tableau, if I had to imagine. And they're, you know, specifically in Excel, you click insert chart, and then it shows you maybe a three by three grid of the possible charts you can make. And I think mm -hmm. people are somewhat limited to that. One of the things you do really well in, the, in your book is it is like software agnostic. And so I was just wondering... What role do you feel like software plays when choosing a chart? Would you choose the software first and then build the chart in the software? Or would you choose the chart first and then choose your software after, secondarily? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think it, it kind of depends on the context too. Like if you're, for example, using data visualization to analyze and explore data, then that's going to be pretty software dependent. You know, like tools like Tableau, for example, are very good at exploratory uh, analysis. Where, but if you're if you're creating charts for communication, especially what I call sort of everyday charts for reports and presentations, so not fancy scientific charts or data art or anything like that, but you know the stuff that's going to go into your your PowerPoint slides and, and reports. Generally, the software doesn't matter because I think you know ninety nine times out of a hundred your best with sticking with some you know pretty simple chart types now there are i think about 50 of those <laughs> you know there's there's 30 that i cover in this book and then 20 in in, in that book which are most more kind of advanced you know listeners here are probably gonna not think of things like scatter plots and histograms as, as advanced but a lot of people do and so those kinds of charts though those 50 chart types are easily created in any major data visualization software application if you are creating things like data art or infographics or scientific visualizations, then the software starts to become much more important because you're going to get very different capabilities from something like, you know, the, the, like Jump, JMP, which is very scientific, for example, yeah. versus something like Adobe Illustrator, which is going to be great for you know, creating infographics versus something like maybe even coding libraries like D3.js or ggplot, which are great for making data art and very, you know, customized visuals. But for your everyday charts, pff, no, you know, it, it doesn't really matter, essentially. They, all, all the software, you know, applications out there can create these simple chart types. That's interesting. And I, I, I don't disagree with you, but I think that I'm heavily influenced by what I know in terms of what tools to, tools to use. So for example, one of the cool things that I like in your book, and maybe this is an advanced chart and maybe that's why it doesn't follow the rule that you just said, but yeah, let's see, this is in parts two, choosing a chart type. Oh yeah, actually the one, two, three, four chart, the fourth chart you talk about is one that I don't think is, is very common. I think it should be more common is a bump chart. I think a bump mm. chart is fascinating. Basically, if you guys don't know what, what a bump chart is, is it's basically a line chart, but instead of showing a quantitative variable, you're showing the rank that something w was in. So it's, it's very good for showing ranks. I've seen it used for presidential elections and like poll results. I've seen it run for like athletes, like sprinters or runners. And I love the bump chart and it's something that I don't see very often. I'm assuming I could create one in Excel. I don't know how to create one in Excel. I also love an animated bump chart where it's like it's progressing with time and I don't mm. know how to do anything animated in Excel. So if I was trying to show that, and once again, maybe this is too advanced, but I, just from like years of making data visualization experience, I'm like, you know what makes this really simple is Flourish. I don't know if you ever used Flourish before. Yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah, Flourish makes an animated bump chart like seriously so easy. And so like, that's where I would go. And I would never try to do it in Excel. I, I'm a big Python guy. So maybe I'd attempt it in Python, but like that type of chart, I'm like, man, I have to use Flourish to do it, but maybe I don't, maybe I'm just limited to my knowledge. Yeah. So there are some chart types amongst the 50, you're right in, in my books, which are, are maybe a little bit less well-known, but I included them for very important reasons. There are certain circumstances under which if you use like the more common chart type, like, you know, the alternative to a bumps chart would just be a, a regular standard line chart, but where that's actually, you know, the standard line chart is just not going to work. 
it's not going to say what you need to say if you want to talk about how things change in rank over time, right? Yeah. It's it's going to it's going to be a bad chart at that point. And so I'd say there's probably maybe I don't know eight or ten of those fifty charts that are not that well known. But if you want to get really good at this, you need to know about them because there are specific circumstances which do occur actually fairly often in which you actually have to use them. Even if, maybe if your audience is not familiar with that chart type, because if you use the more familiar chart type, you're actually going to potentially even misrepresent the data. Like another good example of that would be step charts. You know, a step chart is basically a line chart, but that looks like stairs kind of, you know, you've probably seen them maybe before. They're not a common chart type, but there are, you know, specific circumstances in which if you don't use a step chart and you use, let's say, a standard line chart instead, you're actually distorting the data. You're misrepresenting it. And so while I always encourage, you know, for these everyday charts that you use the simplest chart type, the most familiar ones, there are times where those simple familiar chart types actually will distort things. They'll distort reality or they just won't say what the audience needs to know uh, about the data. So there are eight or 10 that are set, like I said, a little less common, but you should really know about them. Not to get into the weeds here, but I want to go into that step chart. When would I want to use a step chart versus a line chart? I'm curious about that. Well, a good example would be, let's say you're showing, I don't know, like the price of an, of an item on Amazon over time. Ah, okay. Yeah. Right. And so essentially, you know, how that data works is you have a price change and then that price change essentially remains in effect until the next price change when it, you know, maybe jumps up and stays there for a while and then goes down. And so if you connect those price changes with a standard line chart, it's going to look pretty yeah. weird, right? I, and I agree. I've even seen people like actually really misinterpret a chart like that to look and they think that, oh, the price kind of steadily declined from yeah. one point to the next, it's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> that is not what happened, right? So even though it is a less common chart type, if you use the more familiar chart type, i.e. standard line chart in that case, you're gonna throw people off. Yeah, that makes sense. In my head, I was thinking like Fed rate changes, like with interest rates from also, the Fed. And also, that happens yeah. at a certain interval. And yeah, exactly. If it goes from 2% or to, to 1%, there's usually not a, it doesn't sit a day at one and a half. It's an abrupt change. So, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, if you have, there's two conditions, right? If you have values that occur at irregular intervals of time and that persist over yeah. time, then you have to use a step chart. You cannot use a standard line chart in that case. So there are some cases like that where you have to actually use the less familiar chart type. That makes sense. And that's why Practical Charts was written. I see it. I see it now. There you go. Uh, yeah. One one of the things I wanted to talk to you about, which I thought was which was kind of interesting, was this concept of doing data visualization for exploratory reasons versus communication reasons. Yeah. And just to let our, our audience behind the the curtain a little bit, Nick and I were kind of planning a segment where I sent some data sets and I was like, how would we visualize these? And I honestly sent them too late to really put them in the segment. But Nick and I were talking about it and one of the things I think is interesting, Nick, I don't actually know your full background. I know you've been doing this data viz education and consulting for a while. I don't know exactly where you started, but I started as like a data analyst and then a data scientist. And then I got really into data visualization kind of af after doing that. And so I've always kind of started my analysis from like dirty data to cleaning the data, to storing the data, to creating models with the data, to then doing data visualization kind of at the end. And one of the things that you had mentioned was it's like, well, a lot of the times when we're trying to do like good data viz for communication, we don't even want the full data set. We want like the very clean, the very polished, like almost end results that we're going to communicate mm -hmm. there. And so I just wanted to hear your thoughts on what's data viz for exploratory versus communication purposes. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point, which again, unfortunately, a lot of people don't really appreciate is that their data visualization can, can be used for all sorts of things. Uh, and especially if you're talking about communication versus analysis, those are just utterly different use cases. But unfortunately, when a lot of people talk about, you know, data visualization best practices, they don't actually distinguish between the two use cases, right? But the, the be, you know, best practices and guidelines that apply are radically different. If you're just creating charts for yourself to explore data, find patterns, interesting insights, exceptions, anomalies, that kind of thing, right? Because you can use, in fact, really esoteric chart types if you want, you know, because it doesn't matter because you're the only one who's ever going to see it. 
as long as you understand what you're looking at, that's, that's all that matters. And you don't have to worry about things like storytelling or annotating the, you know, the charts or having, you know, uh, you know, chart titles with uh, messages in them. Obviously, you know, you don't have to worry about any of that. And really what you're typically going for in that context is speed and iteration, right? Just looking at the data from as many different angles as you can, you try different filtering, different chart types, you know, throwing spaghetti against the wall, essentially, and just seeing if there's anything that sticks, you know, is there anything interesting that kind of pops out? When you found those insights, of course, then you need to completely change modes. Okay, now I'm in communication mode. Throw out everything that I was doing before in terms of best practices and, and you know, selecting chart types and whatnot. Now I'm aiming for very targeted communication, simple chart types, simple as possible anyways, but still say what you need to say about the data and represent the data accurately. I'm going to you know, put a lot of thought into the, the chart titles and the messaging and, and the colors and, and all that kind of thing. And so really, you know, I'm very clear about that in the beginning of my books, that this is, these, these books are about communication. You know, at some point, hopefully I'll be writing another book called Graphs for Analysis. It's actually a course that I've started teaching as well, but that is just very, very different in terms of, you know, that, that book is going to be a very different kind of animal than the books about communication. It's so cool because really when it comes to data visualization is there's a bunch of numbers and you're trying to figure out what story do these, do these numbers tell. And when you're the person who's been cleaning the data, staring at the data, analyzing the data, you actually become quite intimate with it. Like you really understand mm -hmm. it from forward yeah. backwards. And when you're trying to, when you create a visualization, you have all that context because you've put all the groundwork into really understanding what's going on. That At that point where it's like the storytelling, the actual chart type, like it doesn't really matter because you kind of know the story from just, you know, living inside of the data for so long. Mm -hmm. The issue comes when you have to present that to a CEO or some sort of person who's outside the data. They're unfamiliar with the data. They don't know the context. And they're yeah. only going to really come to know the data through your chart. You kind of have to pick up the slack for them with your chart type, your title, your color schemes, all, all that stuff to kind of paint the full story for them. You've kind of been in the, the trenches, so you know what's actually going on. When you're not in the trenches, you have to be really careful and really intentional on how you're portraying the story because these people just don't understand. They're not there with you. Exactly. Yeah, no, that's, that's well said. I mean, this is, you know, unfortunately, a really common problem. In fact, there's, I think a couple of problems wrapped up in, in what you were talking about there. You know, the first is that as analysts, we often have a tendency to kind of fire hose our audience. And especially if it's the CEO, if it's somebody who's really senior, they don't need the fire hose. They need very tightly distilled key messages that they can absorb very quickly because they're very busy and they don't have time to, you know, get all of the secondary information and, and all the context. And in effect, they're kind of relying on you to sort of have that. Like you kind of dealt with all that and you're just giving them the very distilled key message. We have this problem, you know, here maybe are two or three recommendations about what to, uh, what to do about it. It's really neat because once again, I've never been, I've always been into data visualization, but always in the context of I'm a data analyst or I'm a data scientist, not like a, a data visualization specialist. And so one of the things you talk about in your book that's, that's related to this about like kind of, kind of this, this idea of exploratory, and it's actually just three pages in your book. It's called the spray and pray chart arrangements. And it mm. really resonated with me because I was like, yeah, that's what I've been doing my whole career. I just didn't know oh, that <laughs> like that's what the name was. And, and for those yeah, who yeah. are unfamiliar, which I'm assuming everyone is because I was unfamiliar, is the idea, and correct me if I'm wrong, the idea with the spray and pray is basically you're trying to create as many maybe not as many charts as you can, but you create lots of different charts trying to capture one story or multiple stories. And you're not exactly sure which one your shareholder, which one might resonate best with them. And so you kind of present to them a buffet of, of data visualization and you say, hello, my Lord or my lady, which one of these would you like of these appetizers? And mm -hmm. they, they're like, oh, you know what? that visualization is really good. I want more of that visualization. So usually that's from my perspective, that's like I give them a 15 page PowerPoint with one visualization on each slide. They're like, oh, I really like slide seven and slide eight, you know? And then I spend the next, I don't know, two weeks really perfecting those two visualizations because you know, when I created them, it was just messy for me. And I cleaned it up a little bit for my boss who still has a decent amount of the context, but we're trying to present to a shareholder or the board who doesn't have the context. And so we really spend the rest of the time perfecting it. And I was like, this whole process 
makes sense now the way that you're explaining it the spray and pray chart arrangement. Yeah. Yeah. So that's actually, the term is actually an insult. <laughs> I kind of borrowed it from military circles where it kind it's, of is, yeah. it's basically kind of the act of kind of randomly spraying, you know, projectiles somewhere in the general direction of the enemy and hoping that one of them is going to hit, right? It's considered very wasteful in that context. But in these situations, which unfortunately are all too common, where we've been asked to create a chart or, you know, to do some kind of analysis, but without being told why, you know, like the classic sort of example is a CEO who just says, oh, I need, I need to break down expenses by department. It's like, okay, great. Are, are you worried about, you know, which departments are spending uh, more money or do you want to compare them to their budgets to see which ones are performing best to, you know, sticking to their budget? Like there's all sorts of ways that you could respond to a request like that. And then the CEO is like, I I'm busy. Just make me a chart. It's like, oh. Okay, so now I don't know what the job of the chart is. And we, you know, at the beginning of our, our talk here, we were talking about how important that is. And now you're like, ah, I don't know, right? I mean, there's a million ways that I could show this data set, which is always the case, by the way, even for very, very simple data sets, you know, six values, you know, give me 10 minutes and I'll show you 50 ways to show six values. It's like, okay, well, which one, which, you know, when do we choose? And unfortunately, a lot of people will just kind of put all their eggs in one basket. Right? They'll pick one view you know, say, so, okay, well, we'll show a bar chart with comparisons to budget or whatever. And it's like, eh, you know, but if you're only doing one, your odds of it kind of hitting, it, you know, it actually answering whatever question prompted, you know, the CEO to ask for that, you know, type of chart in the first place. And your odds are really low, right? You know, it just basically, you know, you're making only a single bet. You can drastically improve your odds. And it sounds like you kind of also, you know, realize that through experience by showing multiple views, you know, typically I aim for like three or four. And so I'll essentially come up with like hypothetical questions, maybe that they, that prompted them to ask for this data or insights that they might be interested in. And then I'll design a couple of different charts, a couple of different visuals around there or one visual per question, one visual per insight. And then it, you still might not get a hit, right? They still, it might look at the three or four and go, yeah, none of these are useful to me, but the odds are much higher that they'll be like, okay, yeah, that second one, that one's interesting, right? And then maybe you go back, just as you described, you go back and do another iteration. Say, okay, you know, now that we know that it's kind of version B that you're really interested in, ah, okay, I've just learned a whole bunch about why you were asking me for this information. So now I have a much better idea of what the job of the chart is in that case. A hundred percent. It's so funny because now I've kind of been on both ends of it where, you know, I was working as a data analyst. My boss was like, Hey, tell me what's going on. Tell me what's going on here. And, and it's like, maybe the boss didn't even know what's going on. So I perform these data visualizations. I make the smorgasbord. I present, Oh, I really like this one. I really like that one. And I think a lot of the time, and, and now on this other end, when we're doing the capstone module of my bootcamp, I actually allow my students to work for me and visualize my company's data. So we'll look hmm. at things like my social media data, my YouTube data, my podcast data, my marketing nice. data, all that good stuff. And now I'm the other end where I'm the busy CEO, not giving them good enough direction. But a lot of the times is you don't necessarily, you only see the six inches in front of you and you don't necessarily know what you want until you see the six inches and then you see the next six inches so on yeah. and so forth. And so it's so right. funny because now I've been on the other end and I just really liked this method. I think people can really learn a lot by, by picking it up and testing it out because it's really not all that much more work. You're probably, you know, creating these charts. It's just, you have to show them and see which, which one your, your boss or whoever you're trying to communicate to resonates with. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I completely agree. You know, when I started doing this number of years ago, my life got much simpler because it's actually, you're right. It's actually easier to create multiple views than a single view. If I try to create a single view, it's kind of stressful because I'm really hoping that this is going to be the one that they, you know, they actually, you know, is going to be useful to them. Whereas if I have sort of several chances, it's, it's actually a lot easier, right? And say, okay, well, if they wanted this here, if they wanted to know this though, here's, here's a, a different view. And so it's actually, I would argue less work to create multiple views than to try and 
pin all your hopes on a single one. I love it. Okay, Nick, this has been super helpful. If people want to learn more about you or learn more about data visualization and communication, where can they go to learn more from you? The best place to start is my website, which is just practicalreporting.com, one word. If you go to the top nav and click the contact slash follow link, there's like an email form, a link to my LinkedIn profile, which I hope everybody will reach out to me on LinkedIn and follow me. And uh, yeah, hope to see you there. And the book, don't forget the book. Well, the book is on the website. <laughs> okay, perfect. Good. I, I'm a big fan of the book. I really liked that method at the end, the spray and pray charts. And like I said, there's 150 pages of how to choose the right chart type. So if that's something you struggle with, I think the book will definitely help. We'll have the link to your website, your LinkedIn, as well as Nick's book in the show notes down below as you guys can check him out. But Nick, thank you so much for being gracious with your time and coming on. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Really fun discussion. Well, did you guys enjoy that episode? I hope you came away with some great tips on making better data visualization. As always, you guys, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, you enjoy the podcast, the easiest thing that you can do to say thank you is leave us a rating and a review wherever you listen to podcasts. That helps me stay motivated because it makes me realize, oh, wow, people do actually enjoy this show. And uh, it also helps other people like you discover the show. So go ahead and do so if you haven't done so before. You also will get access to our bonus gift if you do so. There's a link for that in the show notes down below. And also, lastly, I recently put out something that I'm pretty proud about. It's called Avery GPT. You can find the link to it down below. Basically think it's ChatGPT mixed with my brain and it's Avery GPT. It's 100% free. You can check out the link for that in the show notes down below. I think you're going to like it. It has a lot of the information that we talk about in the podcasts in chatbot form. So go try it. Give me some feedback. Let me know how it goes. And I think you guys will really enjoy it. Until the next episode, everyone. See you later.